Yeah, I think we can start now. Uh, crisis communication, handling crisis communication in the local church. Uh, why are we doing this? We're doing this because we want all of us, especially when you're in the uh, communication department, to be aware that part of the things that we oversee is being aware of potential crises in the local church. Why is this so? Because we're dealing with people, individuals, who have got issues, and all of us have got issues. And sometimes it impinges on others, and it gets into the media. And this is where, if we are not careful, it can upset why we're here and what we do. So what is crisis communication? What is crisis communication? But feel free to interact. This, this will be a little bit more interactive. Um, when we talk about crisis, what comes to your mind? Wake up. Wake up, wake up, wake up. Now, that was a crisis in the sense that it represented what some of the Adventists are for. And so many people lost their lives and families were impacted negatively in the church as well. It threw the Seventh-day Adventist church into, into the limelight, not for positive reasons, but for negative reasons. That is why we all have to keep an eye um, in terms of the ministry that we are doing in our territories. So let's look at a few things. It says, crisis tests the character of organizations in a way that nothing else does. And Waco did that. The temptation is always to duck when there is no crisis, delay when there is crisis, and hope that it all blows over. This may have worked years ago, but it doesn't work now. When there is crisis, we have to deal with it. We have to deal with it. So you cannot bury your head in the sun during crisis. When there is crisis, we have to be up to talk about the situation. And I'll be looking at how we as communication leaders also contribute to helping safeguard you know, the church and our mission. Now, first of all, how do we define crisis in the local church? Examples of crisis in the local church have to do with things like protecting children from abuse in the church. And you may, you may be aware that we expect all officers in our churches to do what? Safeguard. Safeguarding, yes. What else? They have to be checked. Uh, DBS. DBS, yes. So these are some of the ways we are protecting the church from crisis. Because um, if you've been following the news over the past few years, Churches, it started with the bigger ones, the Catholic Church, then it came to the Anglican Church, the Methodist Church. And a few years ago, the, um, the Jehovah Witnesses were also in the limelight because communities where, you know, there is close-knit relationships are the potential grounds where abusers operate or where they function. And so we have to be aware of all of this and help prepare the church against abuse. So part of our crisis communication preparations is to make sure that those who we select to, you know, uh, lead in the church, they are, they are checked and they are safe and uh, we can trust them 
with our vulnerable people and our children. What other, what other um, area can we guard against in terms of crisis? So there's child protection. What else? Vulnerable Domestic abuse. Pardon? Domestic abuse. Domestic abuse. Domestic abuse. And, you know, in some of our local newspapers, we've had, we've had people who were Seventh-day Adventists who were involved in uh, domestic abuse. Some of them, they, they misconstrued or misused our health messages and they came in the news. Now, there are so many other things, including treasury. If, if we don't have things in place for, you know, um, uh, auditing and making sure that all the monies that are received are taken care of, that can become a crisis for the church. That, you know, this church collects money and it is misappropriated. It can throw us into crisis. That is why we have checks in the church. We have, you know, books to sign. We have individuals to, you know, count the money. So it's not left in one person's hands. And then we check it and then we make sure that there is reporting to the church board and also reporting to the church at large in business meetings. So these are some of the things we're doing to safeguard abuse financial abuse in the church and many others. So you will see that crisis, it is, is something that can, you know, rear its uh, head in any place, from any place. And our role is to also help the church to be aware of some of these things. Vulnerable adults, we've had circumstances and I'm aware of one of them where uh, somebody who from the church was asked to, um, you know, take care of one of the elderly folks, decided to uh, siphon savings from this person. And so we have to make sure that those who are taking care of our elderly folks, they are all vetted and nobody goes to, you know, take care of their monies individually. Yes, Arnold, I've seen your hand. Yeah, uh, one of the things that I wanted to ask is, uh, um, what of the crisis of, uh, say, there's a dispute on doctrinal issues, uh, and some members actually hold family on that in the church, such that it's tearing the church apart, that's one. Or one member may have an issue with the church pastor, and because of the influence that person has, is beginning to have a following and that's tearing apart. Could be, uh, could those be also examples of crisis communication that needs to be dealt with seamlessly? Yeah, there are things we call, you know, um, regular issues in the church, but they become crises when they cross a certain threshold. And so, what you're talking about is uh, conflict resolutions. Uh, Sometimes when conflicts are not dealt with appropriately, they can, they can be, you know, turn into a crisis situation. Uh, so again, we're looking at how can things be dealt with at the onset. When that is seen from the beginning, you deal with it straight away. And let me make reference to what you said earlier on in terms of you know, varying views of doctrines and we have offshoots, um, and so on. Now, in churches that I've pastored, I've made this uh, very clear every now and then, we have to be aware that we have people who claim to be Seventh-day Adventists, but they are not mainstream Seventh-day Adventists, and they feel they have to convert the church. It is always important to highlight this to the church that these are the stands of the church, and if anybody is inviting them to house meetings without any authorization from the church or an announcement in the church, they have to be wary. We don't do things privately. You know, 
Uh, somebody mentioned David Koresh at the beginning. This is how it started. They are in the background and they invite you to private house meetings. And sometimes these things can lead to serious repercussions. And so see those when they're sharing leaflets and so on and so forth. Always remind church members that Seventh-day Adventists, we don't do things, you know, privately. Everything is in the open. If there's going to be a house meeting, it will be announced on the platform. If somebody invited them without hearing it formally from the church, they have to be wary. Is that okay? Yes, it is. Yeah. Uh, one second. I think I should have started recording, but I it escaped me. Can I see if I can start that now? Pastor, it's recording. Oh, it is. Okay, fantastic. Okay. So, um, you mentioned Waco. That was a huge tragedy. And, and that was a crisis for the church here. I still remember uh, in 1982, I was at Newbold, you know, when this man came, he, you know, he took away some students, some brilliant students, and so on. And the media descended on the campus. It was like, you know, something huge. And that is what happens when you have crisis. You are in the eye of the camera. And we were in the camera for the wrong reasons. Even though, and we have to make sure that we're sharing information that this man is not really a Seventh-day Adventist, but, you know, from a branch from a branch. Uh, that, you know, branch from the church. So getting into, into crisis, when there is crisis, who should speak to the press? What are your views on this? When there is crisis, who should speak? President. The president. Okay. Communications head. Actually, it's communications needs, isn't it? If that's their skill set, yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe, yeah. Mm. I mean, you're right. You know, uh, it's not one person who speaks, but we have to make sure that we know who will be speaking on behalf of the church. And now I'm talking about local, a local crisis in your local church when there is a press. Who speaks? The press. I think it's really important that we need to be careful um, when we do speak to the press because um, uh, we need to ensure that the information that we've got is absolutely accurate and then um, that then should follow through to somebody who's higher than us because you know, they're the ones that actually sort of, you know, in the hierarchy, sort of leading the church. So I personally wouldn't speak to the press. If I had that information, I would actually give it to those people in higher authority, higher authority than myself. Mm -hmm. Should it not be somebody yeah. nominated by the church board, and the and the response should be approved by the church board? Yeah, indeed, indeed. Thank you. Um, yeah, good points from both of you, and I'll I'll I'll, I'll uh, talk talk about that. Uh, I've seen Kweku. You've raised your hand. Um, it depends on the issue, um, because some of the issues. Um, uh, you know, as a, as a safeguarding, um, I will say, uh, keeping the church family safe officer, if from the first issue that you talked about, if there's an issue of abuse, uh, that that um, the, the guidance says that we, we need to, if, if there's the issue of a press interest, it has to go through the conference. And there's an educated person in the conference to ma manage that particular issue. So it depends on what the, what, what the issue is. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Now, all the three suggestions you've made, they are all very, very important and relevant. When, we, when there is crisis, who should pick with the press? Uh, Mary mentioned that, you know, the, the church will have to designate uh, the right person to speak. And indeed, it is not just anyone who speaks on behalf of the church. When it has to do with the church and it says, you know, let's say lead Seventh-day Adventist church, Seventh-day Adventist Church means that now this is 
very official. Now, you cannot speak on behalf of the church if you are not trained how to speak to the media. It is very important because there are there is there is a way to deal with crises with the media. And I'll be sharing some of the points with you a bit later so that you have an understanding of it. Uh, you know, there's also mentioned that, you know, you look, where is this crisis coming from? If it is a treasury, crisis from treasury, then somebody who is trained and can speak about, you know, the procedures in treasury and how this could have happened is the right person, the best person to talk about it. If it is about health, Yes, indeed, you have somebody who is a health leader and can explain that this is not what the church said when it comes to this. And maybe, you know, uh, what happened is not really how the church portrayed, you know, how to go about health. And so it is important that we look at who is appropriate to speak on behalf of the church. And some of the cases, the communication person can be the one who speaks what it is. He can be approached and he will tell, or he or she will tell the, um, the friends that, you know, they will come back to them. And what you do during that process is that you relay the information to the leaders to see who can best speak to the press on the issue. And if it is about writing a statement to the press, that can also be done, you know, with the with communication person also involved. But a lot of the cases, the church pastor is the one who is leader of the local church and uh, best to speak on behalf of the local church. Unless there is somebody who can be designated to speak appropriately on a particular subject matter. Are you with me? Yeah, ma'am. Okay. So knowing and knowing how and who to collaborate with during a local crisis. When there is a crisis, you have to see, come together, see who is best to work with to deal with this crisis. If it is coming from, you know, like as I mentioned earlier on, uh, from treasury or from, um, you know, child protection issue, you need these individuals to be part of the loop to find an understanding how this came across and how to communicate with the local press. On the and so there has to be crisis management plans for your local church, that is procedures, that when the press knocks on your door or makes a phone call, you must always let them know that you'll get back to them. Get back to them with their response. And usually there is a time scale that can be given. We call it a golden hour uh, where you can, you know, meet and find the appropriate response to them. Now, in your local church, how do you decide that an event is a crisis? I think we, we handled a bit of it earlier on. Because there are so many things that can be problematic in a church. The reason why sometimes, you know, I mean, the board is constantly dealing with different issues. But regular problems or normal problems are not necessarily crises. It could be an issue which, you know, the church will need to monitor. Or probably we can say that this is a problem, the kind of the church leader deal with day in and day out. It is always a judgment call when a situation is going to be a crisis. And usually you ask a question, are people's lives involved? Is it involving people's health or welfare? Or, you know, people's welfare are at risk. These are the questions you ask 
to ascertain whether this is going to be a crisis. Yes, Kweku. Um, just want to politely ask Dell to mute his device because we're getting a lot of feedback from him. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, thank you for that, yeah. Yeah, so it is important to, to look at things critically. Now, does the church organization need to act to protect someone's life, their health or welfare, and whether the event is its own responsibility? So, it is always important to look at issues as you see them and see if you can curtail them developing into a crisis so that they don't become a crisis. And that is part of what you bring to the church board, that look, there is something happening here. You know, should we look into it? Or there are so many leaders who are not willing to be, DVR, um, to be, to be checked in terms of their um, uh, eligibility to work with children or vulnerable adults. So look at this and then let a church see how best to handle that situation. Very important. Now, there are times when you may not be aware of anything, but it comes through you know, the, the media and they could portray the organization. You might say, fairly or unfairly, how do you deal with this? Now, this is where it is important to look at the situation and consult. If it is something that is outside your remit, consult the conference uh, leadership and communication department to say, look, this information has appeared in the press about the church. What do we do? It could be that uh, somebody um, is involved in rape. And it may be that, you know, they, 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 they bear the name of the church with them, that they are a Seventh-day Adventist member. Sometimes we monitor this and begin looking how to respond to the issue. Uh, sometimes they may not mention the name of the church and so you leave it, but it is good to be ready just in case they mention the name of the church to write about this individual, you know. So those are some of the things uh, to be aware of, monitoring what goes on in the local press, within the church, and even um, yeah, in, the, in the courts, if a member is involved in, in a legal issue. And all of this have to do with preparation. Be prepared whenever, I mean, for all situations. And part of the preparations are what we spoke about earlier on. If you have in place checks for those who are leading, checks for those who um, are handling finance, uh, making sure that, that those who are, how do you call it, overseeing certain things, they are all the appropriate, the right people. And so when you are responding in crisis, you can say that the church as a body has always made sure that these things will not be happen, will not happen. And so we have these things in place. And show how this is an unusual situation and that a church will be working with the appropriate authorities, you know, to deal with it. Um, we don't defend people who are involved in things that the church doesn't stand for. And sometimes somebody may be a very, you know, may be very devoted and committed to doing great church work. But maybe behind the scenes, they're doing things that are not in line with their belief or faith. When it happens, we hold, there is a way to respond. And this is why you work with leadership and statements can be crafted to address the situation. Okay, feel free to ask questions as I go along. Uh, otherwise I'll be sharing seven tips for crisis communications. Seven tips for crisis communication. Yes, quickly. 
send your hands raised. Yeah, um, th this was quite prominent during the um, Black Lives Matter issue and um, during the COVID uh, issues. So one of the criticisms is that the church was incredibly silent um, and did not put out a statement um, um, during that time. And it felt as if, you know, silence in the, you know, during oppression is complicit with the oppressor. And um, some of us really did struggle that there wasn't any press statement um, when this issue was gripping the whole world. Um, but our church was silent. And, and unfortunately, our pastors were fellowed. And uh, we felt a little bit abandoned um, at that time. Times have moved on a little bit, and um, you know, as as usual, it's it's become a bit quiet. But mm -hmm. I'll be interested to hear your views on on um, on that and why the church was quite silent when uh, predominantly a lot of people are black um, within the church, and uh, we felt that you know um, there was no response from our church. Thank mm. you. Yeah, thank you for for bringing that up and. Um... I was doing this uh, with some ministers and somebody raised a very similar concern that you shared. Um, you know, as a world church, our church is very diverse. And so when there is an issue of the magnitude that happened in the US, uh, it takes a lot of reasoning and working to make sure that we're not alienating anyone um, and in as much as you don't have to rush to make statements, you have to be quick as well. Uh, eventually, we had a general conference making a statement um, regarding the George Floyd situation. Now, originally, people responded differently. And in America, I was following how different conferences made statements uh, regarding the issue. Here in the UK, I was then the communication director for the South England Conference. And being aware that, you know, the overflow, um, overspill came here and people were involved in demonstrations and so on, we made a statement. We put a statement on our website. And also I was handling a magazine, um, a quarterly magazine, and we focused, we did a special edition in the heat of it to address the situation as it pertains to us in the UK. It did get a lot of commendation, even from the US. And the GC, one of the departments, requested permission to publish one of the articles that was shared. And we made use of the diversity, the demographic within our church and the South African Conference to write on the issue, addressing it. And so, yes, there was response uh, regionally. Um, so, yes, at every stage, perhaps, you know, you we all have a right to say to leadership, what are we saying about this? And there are situations where there is no need to say anything as well. Uh, if saying anything is going to, you know, cause more confusion than, you know, help the situation. I hope that is helpful. Uh, thank you, Pastor. <laughs> Yeah, so there are situations like that, but yeah, there are situations when it is, you know, in our domain, we have to make uh, statements about it. And so the seven tips for crisis communication is preparation is everything. And it is more important to be prepared for crisis, which is the awareness we, we're making now. When you are aware that when there's when there's crisis, there is a process to follow. There are protocols. It helps you to know what to do. Yeah, but zero preparation or leaving things, you know, uh, 
just to be there. When you are bumped upon by the press, you will be looking, you know, uh, speechless or looking bad, feeling bad. And people can, can see through your body language that what is there something wrong, that you are not at ease, which is why it is important to know which area, you know, does a crisis fall under and who can best uh, talk to it. And so the point here is that we cannot say that we're not saying anything, especially when the crisis has to do with us. The option of doing nothing and saying nothing is not a good one. In a crisis, we must be ready to step forward and speak out. If we fail to do this, or if we do it unconvincingly, the consequences are likely to be severe. As far as the media are concerned, silence and confusion imply guilt. Uh, point number two, and this is very important, the only caution which matters is from now on, no one says anything to anyone except through comms. What am I saying here? We have to say something in, during crisis, but if you have not been designated to speak on, the, on behalf of the chair, don't say anything to the press. You can always refer them to the right people. Just say that with your request, I'll refer you to the, the right people who can handle it or deal with it. Yeah. We don't want just anyone speaking on behalf of the church. Uh, we are aware that in the past, some individuals have gone on television, joining debates that are controversial, thinking that they're going to speak on behalf of the church and they have portrayed the church in a very bad light. Um, I don't know if you're aware of the big question. Uh, it's one of the no-go areas because that program is an entertainment. It doesn't solve any, any, any uh, how do you call it, uh, problems. And at most, if you are given any time at all, two minutes, do you think you can use two minutes to explain effectively one of our doctrines? Impossible. That's why we advise we don't go there. Um, yes, I've seen Dell's hand, Dell Chambers. Sorry, I, think I was just going to, you already kind of said what I was going to say. Um, just remembering the Kilroy Silk show during Waco, and the person represented there was adequate at explaining doctrine, but um, when we explained certain parts that was to do with the fire that's going to come, the judgment, it just wasn't necessarily tactful. Um, and I can't really say the gospel delivering it, it can be intact or not being intact, but um, looking at the audience, and there has to be a little bit of um, discernment, reading the audience. To, like you said before, not being able to explain a certain doctrine, leading with a, um, a part of doctrine which can lead to debate, would then make for more controversy than they'd be doing healing. Um, the person was an adequate speaker, but I think the person that, to, to be used, whether you're in the comms locally or at whatever level, um, um, they should have uh, an understanding of how your, the audience is going to perceive it, especially the non-learned, the non-scriptural, you know, base uh, individuals, and um, do it the way. I think Jesus was obviously inadequate, very adequate in that way, where he would not pitch stuff where the person would understand it, because it is about engaging him. It's not necessarily about um, pitching it the way that we're normally doing in church. Um, it's, it's pitched, when it's, when it's still, uh, an audience that doesn't have that kind of background it, obviously you have to choose the words very wisely and not necessarily, not necessarily go secular mm -hmm. but definitely break it down so that it's understandable and if jesus the best teacher felt to do that then i believe it's a great model to follow yeah thank you thank you for making that point and and that is that is so true yeah now the third point um of the seven is uh, most crises emerge from a media call or something on social media. Don't try to move too fast. You have an hour, what we call the golden hour. Use it to verify, to think, and compose your initial response. Show concern, you know, uh, be concerned, remain calm, 
and be human. That's a key thing. If you are supposed to, you know, respond. Or, I mean, if you are dealing with the media, yes, be, be, be concerned. Just let them know that we've, we, you've heard or, you know, uh, we're aware of this, but you refer them to the appropriate person. You, you get back to them within an hour. Uh, the media allows that. And so you don't have to feel pressured, you know, to give them a response. Uh, they may push you, but when they know that you know the protocol, they, they will relax. But if you tell the media that you'll get back to them in half an hour or one hour, it has to be one hour. It shouldn't be an hour, 10 minutes time. They would have gone with their own story already that the church refused to respond. So it is important if you give a time scale, honor it. But use that time to gather information, speak with those who will be, you know, uh, who, who will be, I mean, the right person, individuals to speak with to deal with the situation. Pastor? Hello. Uh, yeah, I, I think our benchmark should be the saying, act in haste, repent at leisure. You know, we, we don't want to give a good reaction, which is why, as you're saying, tell them to come back or we'll come back within an hour is really good advice. Yes, yes, yeah. Thank you. That's, that's it, yeah. And so it's very important. Then you don't feel under pressure. You tell them and work within that one hour and get back to them. Yeah, so that's the point. Don't try to move too fast. And when you are contacted by the media, these are the questions you can ask them to. Who are you? Where are you from? What is it you want? When is your deadline? What information do you have? And you can ask them, who else have they spoken to? And you can tell them, this is just an example, I'm in a meeting, or can I get back to you within half an hour, or can I get back to you in an hour? And they indeed will uh, respect that. So this is, this is one of the processes you can use. Uh, and number four, um, your initial response is extremely important. And that is when you get back to them, whoever is speaking to the media, it's often your only response. It needs to be written by someone who has been around the block a few times. It will be accessible forever, which is why we need that space to make sure that we are crafting the best response we can give to the media. Yes, Leslie, can I, uh, you've raised your hand. Yeah, um, from, from my own personal experience, I think sometimes one of the mistakes we make is that we go into defense mode. And uh, while we don't like to hear bad things about our church yeah. and the people we trust, we have to understand we're dealing with human beings. And truth, as, as Christians, truth matter. It's not my job to defend the pastor if he molested a child. Or if one of my elders is gay, it's not my job to defend him. My job is to get to the truth and we need, when we're dealing with the media, what we don't understand, because I've worked in the media before, 90% of the times when the media come to you, they've already done their background check and they got the facts. So when we go, there's a church lying to them, trying to cover up and make things sound good. They have already spoken to people, they have already done their research, and they have come to you to see what you will say. And it's important as a church that we are truthful. Too many times I've seen the Adventist church lied, tried to cover up things, and it spilled back in their face in the end. Um, we are not perfect. As a church, we are, we are not perfect, and we need to admit that. Thank you, Leslie. Um, I think in an in-depth um, presentation on crisis communication, how to respond, all of those things are part of it. 
uh, we're not there to lie. We're not there to uh, defend an individual at all costs. But there are different ways we deal with responding to the media in the sense that we have to remember also that we have um, responsibilities of care for even the offender in the sense that is there a pastoral aspect. Um, it doesn't mean that we're defending them, neither are we supposed to defend them at all costs. But if, if this is what you are telling the whole world, that if people make a mistake, they are thrown under the bus, the many folks you want to reach out to will also be careful whether they want to join your church. So there is a delicate way of showing that this person has done wrong and you're willing. It's not, we, we don't provide a judgment. We are willing to work with the appropriate authorities to look into this issue. You know, I mean, if it goes to the police, we can only cooperate with the police. Um, so that is that is how we deal with those things. I hope that is helpful. But wasn't wasn't it that the exact argument the Catholic Church was using? Um, what do you mean by that? Well, well, they were saying that they 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 were trying to help the offender and they were trying to um provide grace and all this kind of thing. No, um, I don't think that is what. I'm referring to that, you know, the passion should be covered. No, the reason we do, you know, our, how do you call it, safeguarding uh, procedures is that if somebody goes against it, they will face the full rigors of the law because they chose to. But we are not, we, will, we are not making statements that said, this person is evil and it has nothing to do. We just show that they have offended and they will face you know, we'll work with the authorities in terms of, you know, what they have done. Uh, we don't provide the judgment. We just leave it to them. It is very likely that perhaps even when uh, the case, you know, when the case comes up, it could be that it's a false allegation. How do you deal with somebody who perhaps was in that situation? What do you think he would think about you that as soon as there was an allegation you threw them you know you, you rejected them you want to portray the thing in a way that this is an unusual case and you probably will even have a conversation with the individual that this is a police case and um, we can they, they will do the investigation and the church can only cooperate with them I don't know if I've made myself clearer than what I said earlier on. Leslie, I'm still, your hand is still up, is it? Sorry, my hand wasn't up. Uh, anyway, what I was really saying is not to um, jump to judgment. I was referring to cases where we know, where, and I'm speaking from experience, where something happened, we know the truth, and we try to make it look as though, you know, I'm not saying that something happened, somebody was accused, and then we just jump. And even after the, the, a person has committed an offense as a church, there's a procedure that we have to follow as Christians. But there's also a legal procedure that needs to be followed. Indeed. So I'm not saying that we must, we must go and say people must go to hell or they're wrong or they're right. That's not our job. My, my, my statement was in connection when we find out the truth, it's our job not to cover it up. And too many times we try to do that and it backfires on us. Yeah, indeed. I mean, our role is not to cover up any any wrongdoing. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Kweku. Yes, Pastor. I think in, 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 in relation to what you said, our initial response is, include, uh, is extremely important. Yeah. I think that you normally have communication to say that as a church, we, for instance, in cases of abuse or allegations of abuse, you know, that that, that statement should, should, you know, normally would come along the lines of, as the church, we take allegations of That's right. abuse quite seriously yeah. and uh, we are going to cooperate with, um, you know, the law enforcement agencies in any investigations that they, mm -hmm. they, they take. 
uh, because that that statement is to send a strong you know i'll say message to anybody contemplating and mm. that that's the church's position so yeah. as well as we don't want to throw anybody under bus and and in case it is a false uh, allegation i think that that response would also send a clear message that you know we we uh, against anything of, of that nature. Thank you. Indeed. Thank you. Let's go to the fifth point. Um, when you're dealing with crisis, you know, it says separate the people handling the crisis from the people dealing with the communication of it. And so um, let's say there is, there is an accident in the church or whatever. Uh, we might send individuals who are taking care of those who have been harmed, taking them to hospital and maybe providing uh, counseling or whatever. But then the person doing the communication will be able to relay this information during their response. That a church, you know, this incident came out of nowhere and as soon as it happened, we dispatch these individuals to make sure that their family is safe and they're being catered for, their children are being handled by this. And also we've provided a counselor and so on to deal with the situation. So folks will be acting on uh, dealing with the situation, but then you still have those who are speaking on behalf of the church regarding the situation. Uh, number six, training. Most organizations and their leaders get media training once or twice a year. In crisis, the media are like sharks. That is why it is important to understand how to deal with them. So we're trying, you know, uh, we're trying at a union level and also conference level to give our pastor spokesperson training at least once a year, we're trying to see how this can happen. We have done a few, uh, not all pastors have been given that training, but the aim is to train them so that when there is crisis, they have a protocol in mind so that they can follow um, what most organizations are doing to respond to the crisis. But your role is to work with them. Having this understanding helps to deal with a crisis when it comes, because you can also be supportive of the church pastor in helping the church to understand that there are some protocols to follow. The seventh point is that people neither know nor remember the details of a crisis. And I listen carefully, the crisis itself, people after a while don't remember the details of it. What they remember forever is how the organization behaved during that crisis. That's why the spokesperson is all important. So we don't just get anybody to say things, but we get people who understand how to take into consideration everything so that when they are speaking, they know what to do. And so if there are people who have been harmed, you don't start by defending yourself, uh, Leslie. The idea is that you start by maybe uh, recognizing the pain that you know the victims have endured or are enduring, and you sympathize with them. You start with acknowledging the pain, or that you know, um, even if even if it is their own doing or not acknowledge the suffering that is taking place. And then you'll be able to talk to the situation that the situation, you know, um, has happened in spite of all the, the cautions that the church has put in place for it not to happen. And then show how the church is trying to come to terms with the situation and how they're working with the appropriate authorities to deal with it, you know. So when you understand the process and it's lodged in your head, it's easier to communicate with the media. And you're winning the sympathy of even those who have been affected. The tone of voice, how you respond is very important. 
uh, you can't start being defensive. Then people will say you're not sensitive. The situation on the ground is that people, people's life has been affected. Recognize it, acknowledge their pain and sympathize with them and then move on to the other stage. And then you can bridge what you have said with what the organization stands for. That the organization really, the work that we do is about helping people to have better lives. If it is about health, and we do all these things so that people will have a holistic life. Uh, but this is unfortunate. And we will continue making sure that people's lives are enhanced. Now, a summary before we do uh, have a discussion. Um, so identify a situation when there is a problem, see it, assess it. And then see there is you can understand it, you know, let everybody understand that this is what has happened. Now, how do you cope with the situation? These are the things you do. And then the strategy that you will adopt to go about, you know, what has happened. And then after that, recovery procedures. The church, after the crisis, must come back to life. And it is all part of the crisis communication to deal with getting everybody to, you know, get back to what we do best and reaching the lives of people to know Christ. Thank you, that is the presentation. And then we will use the next few minutes for any comments or questions that you may have. Yes, from uh, in this order, Kweku, Mary, and Leslie. Okay, thank you, Pastor. Um, if you can be brief so that we can allow the others to. Very, very brief, yes. Yeah. Um, on the subject of uh, church discipline, uh, which is often public and quite predominant among the churches that are congregated by a lot of um, Black people. Um, when matters of such nature, which is quite private, very intrusive, very emotive, uh, become a subject of public discourse, um, it, does, it does cause a lot of crisis within our churches. And I, I've studied carefully over my life because I was born into the church, the, the devastation that this causes. What would be your advice in terms of managing some of these situations? Does every family, uh, I would say break up or, or matters of that nature be, be subject to public business meetings? Hmm. Thank Very you. good point. I happened to pastor a certain church some years ago where when I went there, they brought to the church board, they said, you know, this body, they're looking into a family breakup. And my first question that I asked was that among the group, have they got a counselor, somebody who studied counseling? in it, there wasn't. And so I said to them that this marriages are private, private matters. And if there is a challenge in it, it has to be dealt with still privately. Uh, so it is, it is something that some I mean, churches have to be aware of. Uh, you don't handle people's marriages on a chat board unless they, it has to do with some particular situation where there is church discipline, uh, but not, you know, spilling out their relationship in public, because that always tends to divide the church. Is that helpful? We're good. Uh, uh, Pastor, I was referring to the church discipline uh, in doing a business meeting, which, which always... Uh, <laughs> It's always quite distasteful uh, when people's matters are brought for discipline because uh, it is always about censorship and this fellowship and has to put to be a vote and therefore the matters are brought to mm. public scrutiny. That, that is the bit. Yeah. Um, it will be difficult for me to respond to this, not knowing exactly what the situations would be. Um, and that is more an internal situation where you want people to be sensitive as opposed to 
seeing this as a crisis going into the press. Um, it, it's, it's not really germane to this uh, topic, I have to say. Yeah. I mean, we can talk about that later on when, when you have the chance. Uh, yes, Mary, please. I ju it's just a comment on you saying about choosing the right communicator, but I think this scenario applies to our communications generally. Um, I don't know if any of you remember many years ago, there was a case in Australia where a couple were accused of murdering their child and they said that the dingoes, when they were um, yes. camping, had actually stolen the child. Yes. Um, and the, the mother, when she was interviewed on the television, showed absolutely no no emotion and i think the whole world judged that mother as being guilty mm. because of her demeanor when many many it might even have been a year down the line it was actually proven that what they the couple were saying was true and that the dingoes had killed the baby but you know the, we the world judged them as guilty because of their demeanor and their communication yeah yeah so it shows how important communication is yeah, thank you for for uh, saying that, and and that has to do with uh, I think number six of what uh, was it a seven point uh, in terms of you know how you how you make people feel when responding to the media regarding the particular situation, yeah. and it was even more pertinent to us because that couple were Seventh Day Adventists. Yes, mm. yeah. Yeah, and that brought us into the limelight. I still remember that story, I mean, uh, you know, going on for years. And and even recently, it came in to show that you know, there was a documentary that showed that she wasn't, I mean, she didn't kill the, the old child. I think it even was a film. I think they made a, a movie out of it. So yes, when there is crisis, it's very... Very, very important to be intentional in how you respond, taking everything and everyone into consideration. Okay. Our time is almost up. Um, I saw Leslie's hand, but I think that is gone. Yeah. Now. Um, what, what I was saying is that about 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah. When even when we're doing our, our crisis control, as you say, speak to the media, the conference, a lot of times we forget the very church members um, where the crisis have occurred. And we, we're busy doing public relations outside and nobody are, is informing the members as to what's going on with the case, where it's going, etc. And that could create some confusion too. Yeah, thank you for, for that. Yes, um, the main audiences are, you know, the, the, the domain where the thing incident happened. They, they need to know. And of course, your communication, even sometimes through the media, is also directed at them as well. That is 